Hey, check out this live stream. One stage, one couch, zero survey. <laughs> I don't know, like a uh, quick hello, start, but... Um, maybe we should wait. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, not, yeah. not right now. Oh, of course. Do you have the mic set up now? Um, not yet. Okay, okay cool. It's pretty, I think... It's, yeah. Um... Yeah. They called me mommy. The other day. I'm just going to give you both both mics because the other day someone was here. Yeah. And the, the PA can go in. Okay. Yeah. The volume. Is the battery of both of them good? I don't know. You don't know? Um, hey, see, it, 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 this is. Uh, this is all ready to go. See, hey, hola. Yeah. Uh, what's up? Um, are there extra batteries in here in case we need to hot swap them? I am not Asian. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the mic? Who says you're Asian? These people. Oh, no. Asian Dom conference. <laughs> <laughs> Not Asian confirms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think the uh, mic is over there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Just go stand right next to it. Oh, okay. Well, the thing is, but if you if you speak, no, here, okay. they should be able. To can you guys Asians hear? are literally subhuman. No offense. You guys are weird. <laughs> can you guys say the guy who said, can you guys hear me? <laughs> Asians are good at math. Okay, they can hear you. These people are crazy. I think we're good. Um, okay, turn, turn it off. Hola, 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 city. Hola, city. Hey. Who is this guy? He wasn't in here. <laughs> You can hear me. Yeah, but found the batteries. Let's uh, bring down the uh, check-in. 
Sergey doesn't like sparkling water. <laughs> you like that still? So, <laughs> Yes. Um, the battery situation a little uncertain, but we got more batteries there. Maybe we should just put new batteries in. Who needs in a case. battery for like the microphones? Yeah. Um, how do these open up? Um, <laughs> just it. Okay. Why? Why are you worried that the the batteries open up? I've had that happen before. Really? Yeah. So, How many are in there? Yes. I'm gonna change the other one to grand. What's that? Yeah, yeah, change the other one to grand. Um, I'm not sure what she is capable of. This one? Oh, yeah. The, that is the live stream right there. Yeah. And the, there's the camera. They're making fun of you. Um, he's saying this is fundamental. Yeah. And the cell for water. I don't know what the cable is. It's around your police. Okay. I'll get Thank you. 
Which of these controls it? Which of these is like controls the mic volume? Um, I think it's on the back there of the speaker, but um, I'm not quite sure. Well, there are some multiple speakers, right? Uh, okay, and then it's there. Yeah. As kept it. All right. Um, so this I just, just need the remote for the, sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, I just need the remote for the projector. Yeah, we're good. Do you ever find a charging cable for the other light? Um. The rest of the mask are gone and everything that feeds the speaker. No, no, just turn up the speaker volume. There's a master volume in our program. I'm looking for an Epson. Oh, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Jesus. I'm looking for an Epson remote. Testing, testing. I think that's that's probably good. No, and then once you do that, then we can. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I have lots of room here, okay? Yeah, so Alicia and I will save you, so now we'll have it up to you. Yes. Is the podium a good height for you? Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. 
Sure. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I don't think we need that. Then, then I, I put them away. Okay, great. Great, 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 great. I don't know where I got that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay, dude. Yeah. I think we're at. You got, you got the volume. Okay, he's, he's doing a screen recording. Yeah, but you know, we, we're not even showing the screen. We should cut. Right. No, just in case. All right, if not, if you could find out what cable it is and just order it. By the way, I think you're. Oh, that's up. Uh... Well, yeah, no, moving forward, we can always order another one on that. It's just in case we could find it now. Hey, you can. You can see it. Yes. Uh -huh. 
Okay. You think we can do it with just that line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, Whoa. Not too loud. we're getting started in a few seconds. Hi everyone. Hi guys, welcome to this space. My name is Alicia, I'm the founder of Starfish. We're a space focused on blockchain and cryptocurrency and uh, adjacent emerging technologies. Um, a bit about us, we are a co-working space, event venue, and community space. So uh, if you're looking for a space to work out of, an office, or you want to do an event, uh, find, me after, find me after the talk, <laughs> or go on starfishcommunity.com. I'm super excited to welcome Chainlink today in this Ethereum developers meetup. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to Grant to introduce Sergey. Grant, there you go. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. This is one of our most popular events this year. Uh, we're doing a live stream for the first time uh, because there was so much demand for it. Um, I'd like anyone to raise their hand that considers themselves either a Link Marine or a Linky. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's a good turnout. Okay, yeah, yeah. Ch Chainlink is one of the most interesting um, crypto communities I've ever seen. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a community or a project that has such a like a hardcore, dedicated following in Chainlink. So, yeah, I'm glad to see some IRL turnout. Uh, anyway, um, I'm sure Sergey needs no introduction. Um, you know, the, the Oracle problem is a very difficult one in crypto, and Chainlink is uh, one of the leading solutions to uh, to help solve it. So, um, yeah, without further ado, here is Sergey, and uh, please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, thanks very much, Grant, and thank you, um, you know, to the Ethereum Meetup and to Starfish for hosting, and you know, and thank you for all, um, you know, all your interest in coming and to, to learn more and kind of think with me together about oracles. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through that presentation and, and talk through some of the main concepts. That'll hopefully create some shared context, and we can we can have questions after. Once in a while, I do questions in the middle, and like. Sometimes it takes a while because we get hung up on a question. So, but we, you know, we can definitely cover questions at the end once we have the, the same kind of context. Because I do do want to discuss and uh, you know hear feedback and that's you know whatever you guys want to chat about. So, um, I think the first useful thing is to kind of frame the the, the problem and um, the size of it and, and what it means. Just you know, once again, to give us get us on the same page, and then we can go into some details about Chainlink and various approaches to to solve an Oracle problem and how to think through that. So essentially, the problem is that smart contracts on various chains, Ethereum or others, they can't uh, talk to external systems. So the way that the the smart contract records the states, uh, the state changes, and you know, transactions and block blocks, all that stuff is secured is via these miners. And none of the miners are designated to go get the data. None of them have integrations with the data providers. You wouldn't want all the miners to go get it at once. And you don't want to designate one miner because it creates front running issues, security holes. So th there's a fundamental reason why you, you currently can't, you in all likelihood won't be able to have a base layer one chain like Ethereum reach out and acquire data. Um, and the reason that acquiring data is, is important is because data underpins um, events, right? So smart contracts, well, not even smart contracts. If we just think about agreements, there's categories of agreements, right? There's agreements about insurance. There's agreements about securities transactions. There's agreements about ownership. 
Uh, right now, the only type of data that can be moved around within a blockchain is the data that uh, lives in the chain itself, and that's essentially token data. The reason that data exists is because you need, you need that data to pay miners to make the whole thing exist. But the, the, the point is that if you, if you don't have events, um, you can't write contract about, about events, right? If, you, if, you can't, if, you can't, if your contract can't know about an insurable event, like you know, what happened with the car or the shipment or the industrial equipment, or you don't know about a market event like a price change, you, you, you fundamentally can't write a contract about that, right? So, so this is the, the fundamental problem of how do we um, expand what these contracts are capable of and effectively, how do we expand them to the point where they can be both written about events while remaining secure? Um, now, just, just, just to make sure we're on the same page, um, we, we're assuming that somewhere between 10 or 20% of our contracts are about ownership transfer, which is something that can be represented in chains like Ethereum and other chains right now. Um, the other 80, 90% of agreements that are, that are based around events, right, that are kind of relative to an event, um, w without a way to get that data to the contract um, while re retaining security, you, you simply can't build that contract, right? So this is, it's like a fundamental gating issue. It's not a nice to have, it's not an improvement. It's, it's a fundamental gating issue to whether you can build a cert, you know, the remaining 80, 90% of contracts that in all frankness, like why I got involved in the, in the, blockchain and smart contract space was, was to have these highly reliable contracts about all of these, you know, provable events, right? Now, let's, let's say we, we make headway in solving this problem. What, what does that mean for the space? Uh, I, I also think this is just some important context before we dive more into the details. So I think the right way to view this is, is how has the space evolved so far? I, when I say the space, I mean like the blockchain slash smart contract space. Blockchains are more about the, you know, the data structure and smart contracts are more about um, highly reliable kind of logic. But in any case, the way the space has evolved is as you get the capacity to build more types of contracts, um, the space kind of makes a order of magnitudes uh, shift upwards. It kind of, if you, if you give people the capacity to build certain types of contracts in our space, because the types of contracts our space allows the highly reliable type, um, people build them. So the, the first transition was basically between 2000, you know, before 2014, what you more, more or less had was multi-signature, well, not exactly 14, but in, in any case, around 12, 13, 14, you had the appearance of these protocol smart contracts, where to build a contract, you had to have a conversation with the developer and you had to tell them, I, wanna, I want my contract in your protocol. They had to talk to them for six months and they had to work on it for six months. And then they had to roll it out for six months. And then, you know, it's a year and a half later, which is like a decade in our space. So it just, it, it was a very bad model. And that's why a lot of people weren't building a lot of contracts. Uh, and then what Ethereum did is it did something very impressive was it, was it took this dynamic of let's make a new contract and it, it made it accessible to people. So you, you now had the ability to build these contracts basically around tokens. And people could sit down in a few days or a week, they could copy, copy a contract or make their own. Or, and, and this is the basis on which all of this um, new economic activity in our space around tokens was born out of, right? It, it wasn't born out of this protocol-based kind of, you know, I'm gonna talk to you for six months when I wanna, wanna do something on your protocol and then that's how I'm gonna get my token or my, you know, basically my contract working once it became accessible to build these types of contracts, I don't know what the numbers are, but the numbers are very large, right? The numbers are very large relative to like VC industry and other, other types of capital markets, right? And essentially Ethereum gets a lot of credit for doing this. It's extremely impressive and you know, they, they did a great job and they're still doing a good job and it's kind of, this. But, but this is what I think happened or what we think happened. What, what we think is gonna happen next, what makes sense from our point of view is if you can take people from writing scriptable contracts only about tokens and ownership transfer, and you can take them to a place where they could just as accessibly and just as securely write contracts about events, right? Write contracts 
around insurance events, market events, shipping events, all, you know, a multitude of events that define basically entire industries. Um, that's the point at which uh, you would see another you know, step function, another some, some amount, large amount of usefulness become available to people. And we're assuming that with, with that capability, they would build those contracts, right? Because those contracts are superior to their centralized counterparts in that they are reliable, right? Like pe people, people like smart contracts because they're these highly reliable mechanisms, uh, digitally, you know, cryptographically guaranteed mechanisms uh, for forming a certain type of contract, right? So our, our goal is to give the capacity to write contracts about all of these events while um, maintaining that key property of security and reliability. So that's kind of the, you, you, you really have to do both. Um, and then there's a, a number of kind of sub goals with ease of use and accessibility and a number of others. Now, uh, fundamentally speaking, the way you do this is you, you, you need um, an additional layer of decentralized computation, or you need, you, you need something called an Oracle, right? Which, which is essentially blockchain middleware in the enterprise world is called an enterprise service bus. Like there, there's a bunch of different names for it. But, but, but essentially it's, it's a piece of software that sits between this highly secure, highly reliable contract state change layer and these events. And it makes these events reliable enough to trigger the contract, right? Because if the, 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 the method of triggering the contract is extremely gameable, the contract fails. Now, nobody really cares why a contract fails. They care that it fails. Right? I mean, they care, but they, what, what, what matters is the, the overall security of the contract. Right? So what, what we're really talking about is not just some kind of middleware or some kind of oracle that somebody codes up in a day or two and just slaps on a server somewhere and it's like, it's, it's going to be fine, don't worry about it. Don't, you know? It's not a problem, no big deal. Um, it's, it's how do we get the same level of reliability as a contract for inputs, outputs, and, and certain cross-chain functionality. So I, I think for this first part of, of what we're discussing, I think the key, the key point to, to really kind of um, either think about and have a dialogue on or internalize, you know, one, one or the other, but it's, it's this idea that you, you, don't really, it, you don't really have a contract anymore as far as just the code running on chain. If, 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 if you're expanding what the contract does, to like um, IoT data for an insurance event, like you're insuring solar panels, right? Your contract is now not just about on-chain code. It's now about those solar panels, right? And it's about the origination of the data about the solar panels, it's about the way contract, and it's about the contract. So it's about, it's a, as you've expanded what the contract does, your surface area has gotten bigger. And so if you believe that the reason people would like to use your smart contract rather than some bank in a box or some centralized system is because it's reliable, because the surface area is now larger, um, you now have to care about that. If you, if you ignore it, it doesn't make any sense because if you, if you just say all I care is that the smart contract code is secure, I mean, okay, well, some, somebody's going to come over and knock, knock down your Oracle or they're going to game a data source and you know, that, because your contract is now defined as something else. The definition of a smart contract has expanded to, to both the middleware that triggers the contract and the data sources that are responsible for informing it of what happened, as well as any, any output systems and, you know, payments or, you know, records updates somewhere or something. So I think that's the important idea is that when you're thinking about these more complex contracts, expand the, um, the things that you need to secure. That, that's now your responsibility if you're building that type of contract. You, you, you've just expanded your responsibility when, when you've made a decision to be, make that type of contract. Now, I think the, um, uh, I th yeah, I think now it's, it's probably, now that we have that kind of shared context, and I, I hope these points are clear, I can obviously answer questions about them af afterwards if they're not, um, is to look at how we're thinking about solving this problem of I've expanded what a smart contract can do, but I want to retain its security. So I want to retain this property of extreme reliability such that I could show up to people and say, you know, my um, insurance contract is guaranteed cryptographically. It's definitely going to pay you. 
um, and for that to be true. Irrespective of adversaries, irrespective of you know a bunch of different things, right? That's kind of the, the standard we need to meet. Now, in, in our approach, the, the, the dimensions that we've decided to focus on so far have been firstly decentralization. Um, that basically means taking uh, good individual oracles and putting them into oracle networks and then defining what is a good oracle network. Um, I can just skip ahead. The answer is a good oracle network is the weakest collection of nodes that you would need to compromise to compromise that oracle network. So if you have 15 nodes and 10 of them all use like one Ethereum node, you, you know, you just really have to compromise that Ethereum node or maybe depending on the consensus compromise those 11 Ethereum nodes or 10 or however many, right? So the, re the real question is, how do we apply the concept of decentralization to, to a smart contract security? Um, the, and I'll, I'll get into more details on this. This is kind of actually just meant to be a roadmap. Um, binding commitments. Binding commitments are where an Oracle makes an on-chain irrevocable um, commitment to uh, an Oracle. Uh, so an, an Oracle makes a commitment to a contract, right? So a contract comes to an Oracle and says, I need you to deliver, my, um, the life of, my, of, of, of me, the contract is six months. I need you to deliver data to me daily. And I need to be completely, absolutely sure that that's gonna happen. Because now I, I, you know, I exist in these two dimensions of the external world and the on-chain events. So these binding commitments are very important. Uh, the second, uh, the third piece is proving reliability. So this uh, focuses on acquiring um, certain amounts of data and presenting that data and accurately assessing that data to show whether a node and a, and a collection of nodes in the form of a network is actually secure. And then um, towards the end, we, we practice something called defense in depth, where we layer multiple security approaches uh, on top of each other. Um, it's pretty much the right way to do it. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll go in towards the end about what that means from our point of view with TEs. So on the first point of decentralization, basically the, I think it's useful to look at the scenario you don't want. Like what, what failure mode are we really trying to avoid? And, and the failure we're trying to avoid is um, you have this decentralized computation running on thousands of nodes. It's reliable because it's running on thousands of nodes. And then you have one node. Like you run the node, or some third-party centralized closed source service runs the node. But let's just say it's you. Now you're running this node. You, you've shifted all your responsibility for the state changes off onto, the, on, onto Ethereum, right? Onto decentralized computational platforms of various kinds. And you've said, I'm not responsible for those state changes. That's not my responsibility. I'm using a platform for that, the Ethereum network, right? And then you're saying, but what I, what I am going to do is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to completely control the outcomes there via some centralized server that I I completely control, maybe with some software that I wrote myself, rolling my own crypto or doing doing any number of things that usually don't don't lead to good outcomes. And realistically, the weakest point in in this in this thing it, it's not the twenty year old data providers who have hardened systems that also practice defense in depth. And it's not Ethereum with its thousands of nodes and a huge open source community trying to knock out every security issue. It's, it's that one server that, that you decided to, to roll your own crypto for and, and run in house somewhere. Like that is the attack vector that people will go after. And people have gone after it successfully. That's, that's basically the attack vector you don't want to deal with. Just like you don't want to guarantee that the state change for the contract is reliable, right? Like if a contract now lives in two parts, you, you probably don't want to, you want to guarantee as little of the contract from, from your infrastructure as, as you can. What, what you want to do in, in this new model of decentralized infrastructure is you want to say, here's decentralized infrastructure, it's going to guarantee outcomes. I'm going to follow the, the, the model of that infrastructure, I'm going to write code, write solidity, I put it in that infrastructure, and I, I now have guaranteed outcomes, both protecting me from you know, security failures and protecting users and providing guarantees that users will get what they need, right? So not surprisingly, the answer to this isn't, isn't particularly counterintuitive. 
it, it's it's kind of let's let's supply the model that made the state change secure, right? The model that made the contract itself secure. Um, let's apply that model to the oracle mechanism. And and that model, I mean, it's, that's a very nice word. It sounds great and makes a lot of sense. You know, decentralization. I'm sure we all hear that word more than enough, right? Um, very exciting word. I mean, it, it's it's basically extreme redundancy. It, it is exciting. Don't, absolutely, don't get me wrong. We build decentralized infrastructure. Decentralized infrastructure is the future, for sure. Well, my opinion, for sure. I mean, I'm putting my whole life into it, so basically, uh, like you know, <laughs> for sure, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. Let's put it out. Um, so, the thing with decentralization is it's basically full replicas run by independent node operators, and then people come to consensus on computations. So, same exact model. So now the assumptions you were making about the contract being secure, we have all these node operators, they're all you know, confirming computations, state changes, retaining them, uh, you know, all, 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 this, all this type of stuff about multiple independent parties doing things relative to a computation. We replicate that dynamic by having Full replicas, and full replicas means like, for example, for the stuff we do for the Ethereum network, we'll have a Chainlink node operator running the Chainlink software, but then we encourage them to, for example, you know, either have their own Ethereum node or use a service that other nodes in the node network don't use. So full, full replicas means you, you, you eliminate as many, as many risks as you can by uh, basically creating extreme redundancy. So, so that's the fundamental idea. Um, the, the next piece of this is uh, how, how binding commitments work in this model. So the, the way binding commitments work is, is that you basically form what we call a service agreement between the oracle and the contract. And then let's say you have three oracles or five or seven or 15 or 21. They all form service agreement with the contract that basically requires them and which they commit to uh, fulfill. Downsides of them not fulfilling that over the long term are a loss of stake in deposits and, oh, and well, that's more in, 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 in the short term, more immediate term loss that they would have. In, in the more long term version, oracles that don't fil fulfill their commitments um, don't get selected in the future. And, and the way to think about this is oracles, um, chain links, I mean, the way, the, the way to think about it is you're kind of mining inputs. Right, so you're validating inputs for m many, many chains. So, I mean, just, just to get a sense of this, let's think about all the, all, the, all the different chains that need inputs, right? All the contracts on those chains that need inputs that don't just relate to ownership. And then think about, okay, let's say people want 21 nodes or 50 nodes or however many nodes for the highest value contracts consistently, and they're willing to pay for security. If, if you deviate from your commitments, you're not gonna be in that quorum of 21 or 50 or 100 or, or 1,000 or however many nodes people want to secure those contracts. And when you have you know, a billion dollars worth of value, um, people, that, that's, that's what people would pay to secure. And so then the question becomes, what will people pay to secure large amounts of value on all these chains? Sorry, this is kind of a divergence, but long, long story short, the idea is that in the near term, you lose um, stake and deposit. In the long term, you, you lose the capacity to be considered a reliable oracle. And what that's worth could be very large. That's kind of the, 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 other, the other part of this. It's kind of like when miners, Bitcoin miners buy mining equipment and they plan that the mining equipment is gonna make, you know, demonstrate like they make an investment in a whole factory and they're like, that's kind of the investment the person is making in the idea that mining inputs into all these chains is, is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so I think now we're, we're gonna go into some more details about our approach um, and we're gonna kind of elaborate on some ideas that I haven't talked about, we haven't talked about as much, but I think at this point it's just useful to have an example to put this kind of more in perspective. So, Let's say you have some kind of crypto cryptocurrencies derivative. Let's say it's a, I don't know binary option where you know both people put hundred thousand in and it's worth two hundred. 
right? So the owner gets 200, just some, some, some dead simple contract. And that's based on the price of some, you know, Bitcoin or some token surpassing, uh, I don't know, a bunch of money, 15, 20,000 or 10 or however much. Um, the contract state is in, this, in the, is in the decentralized computation platform. You kind of shake, shake your hands and you go, okay, we're all set. That's, that's good. No problems there. Then you start thinking about, okay, how do we um, trigger, did I miss a step? No, I did, okay. Um, then you're thinking about how do I get the necessary inputs into, into the contract? That's when you, you can say, okay, I wanna use one Oracle, but then you look at the value in your contract and let's say it's grown beyond 200,000 to, I don't know, a million. Then you might want three. And then the reality is that if the value of that market or of that contract grows, you're gonna to wanna to go beyond three. You're gonna to, gonna to, gonna to wanna to go to five oracles, seven oracles, 15, 21. As the value of the contract you're securing grows, you, you, you're gonna, you're probably gonna be willing to pay more money to make sure that that greater degree of value is secure because the loss is, the risk is also greater, right? Now, you know, that's kind of how this looks, is, is the oracles make a service agreement based relationship with your contract that's running in this um, kind of middle decentralized computational layer. They return the data or they come to consensus about the data either between themselves or, or on chain. Um, and then you also need to pay. So that's another thing that oracles are uh, quite useful for. Yeah, you can't, uh, a contract, just like it can't acquire data, it can't pay in other environments. Um, and a lot, there's a lot of other environments people still wanna be paid in. That isn't like the native environment where the contract lives. So there's actually two dimensions. One dimension is it kind of just in order. The first dimension is how do I trigger the contract reliably? Second dimension is how do I uh, settle the contract, right? Most contracts are about payment. So you, you need to affect the state change from an event and then you need to pay. Um, and if you're not, if, if, if your user doesn't want to get paid on the same environment, like they don't want to get paid in Ether or some token in Ethereum, like they want to get paid in their bank account or they want to get paid on you know, some other chain or, or uh, some kind of retail um, system, uh, then an Oracle is also useful. Now, the next, um, I, guess, I guess the next thing to look at is how, how, I mean, how should we think about trusting these individual oracles and the combination of oracles in the form of an oracle network? I mean, that's really the question, right? The question, the, the, the answer for us in terms of Ethereum and in terms of this decentralized computational layer for the state of the contract, that answer is kind of given to us, right? It's kind of like there's thousands of nodes, there's some mining pools, sometimes people use Infure a lot, but you know, all together, all in all, it's kind of decentralized and I believe that it's gonna reliably do state changes that aren't super gameable or they're guaranteed or something else like that. So the question for us is why should we trust the system of oracles to, to trigger those highly reliable state changes? And that's the real question, right? Now the, the answer to that I think is, is found in basically in a, in a logical and predictive assessment of data. So, so basically because the commitment from an oracle to a contract is on chain and all the performance is on chain, that data very clearly proves whether that oracle fulfilled its commitments. I mean, there's a number of other factors where you wanna avoid adversarial kind of dynamics and adversaries doing all kinds of weird things like pretending to be multiple oracles or you know, making fake contracts to give themselves fake traffic, and some of those we're gonna, we're gonna briefly address. But, but at, at the core, if you, I, I think the nuance here, and I, I think I'm just gonna kind of just chat through the nuance real quick, that, that might be the most helpful thing. When people try to predict outcomes in, in the non-blockchain world, it's extremely difficult because the systems where the information lives, like TripAdvisor about hotels, TripAdvisor doesn't have any idea if there was hot water in my hotel. TripAdvisor or like booking or somebody, they can know that I came to the hotel, they can know that I could check in, but they don't know there's hot water. So I could leave a bad review and say there was no hot water. 
Um, or there was no hot water and the intern at the hotel leaves 50 fake reviews. And that's why these systems don't work from a predictive kind of point of view, is that there's no cost to gain the data, the system can't verify outcomes, and so that's why systems are extremely gameable, basically. Everybody has five stars and, you know, something like that. Or you make a bunch of bots and everybody has one star. So it's, it just completely doesn't work, right? Now, in, in, in blockchain land, both the commitment and the performance happens in the same exact environment. And the environment knows everything that happened, right? So imagine if you, you went to a hotel and booking.com had a sensor that knew there was hot water. Like you couldn't lie about it anymore, right? In, in, in blockchain land, the commitment between the, the Oracle, the thing that's supposed to deliver the event, and the contract is extremely detailed. And then the performance by the Oracle is also extremely detailed, completely verifiable and completely provable, right? It's like, give me data at 12, 0, 0 UTC, every day, give me this data, deliver it to me. Yes, I promise to do that. Every single day at 12, like, oh, one no later, the data is on chain, right? Complete, utter, total clarity about both the commitment and the performance, right? So, so this is a, a different dynamic. In addition to this dynamic, you have costs. So leaving fake reviews on like wherever has no costs. Here to even make a commitment, form a commitment, send data, game this, make requests, all of these things have costs, right? So it's also, it has a built-in anti-spam mechanism. So one fundamental difference is that as the data about um, a con an Oracle's performance grows, because of the costs and because it's so clear what they committed to and exactly what they did, that should be much more predictive data about the security delivered by that specific node operator. And then combining those node operators into a network applies decentralization in a way where you, you just combine you know, 15 great node operators that have a history of delivering thousands of requests successfully to like 50 different contracts each, which it's clear they don't own, uh, which I'm, I'm gonna get into that part of the model later um, in a minute. Um, so th there are a number of things that we can do to float additional data about the reliability of an individual node and the reliability of node operators. Uh, the approach that we've taken initially in this early stage of the network is we do, um, and anybody can be a chain link node operator and there's marketplaces launching, I think this month or, or early next month. And then others, others planned for sometime next couple of months, I don't know the exact timeline, but so anybody can really become a, a chain link node operator. But the approach that we're taking internally is we're basically doing technical review of these folks. The technical review right now consists of on-chain activity on testnet, showing that people can reliably deliver requests. Then another section where we connect them to a service we have called Explorer that consistently tests them for uptime and if they pass a number of checks in the first and the second stage, then we have an interview where we look at their fallback scenarios, their key management practices, and what their infrastructure is. And then we take certain information, such as what the infrastructure is, and we float it to the user. So right now, if you were to go to choose um, Chainlink Oracles, you would be able to choose Oracles in a way that you could see if the node operator was running their own Ethereum node, or if they were using Infura, or if they were using Fuse, or if they were using something else. Because the reality is that there's entire levels of centralization risk. Like there was recently a Cloudflare outage, and there was, there's, a, there's a bunch of situations where, you know, logically speaking, if we're gonna really think about security from a data-driven perspective, we, we wanna know what the node operator's done, we wanna know their history, we wanna know what other centralization risks there might be, Right, such as are they running their own Ethereum node or are they are, are the 15 oracles in your network all using Infura? Right? You can make that decision. You can go, you can go that way. That's not a problem. But you should be informed. Right? You should have an informed point of view on the security risks of, of a system that's triggering your contracts. 
the next piece of the type of data that we think can be particularly valuable, um, at least in these initial stages of the network, is something that leads to civil resistance. So civil resistance focuses on identifying node operators so that they can't pretend to be multiple people at once. So that one guy can't show up and say, I run these seven nodes and we would never know. Right? You, 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 do, you definitely want, well, from the definition of decentralization, the assumption is that you have independent node operators. Now, this is completely optional, and I realistically think in the future, you're gonna have all kinds of different levels of identity certification that different people are gonna require, depending on how valuable they find that dimension of security. I think you're, you, you're probably sometime soon gonna have penetration testing certificates and audits of people's infrastructure once, they're, once their Chainlink Oracles begin securing enough value. And realistically, all of that information should be presented to users. Um, like, the, the, I, I think that there's kind of a nuance here that I, I'm not, maybe not making super clear because it's sort of the first time I'm kind of trying, trying to make it clear in such a public forum. I, I think the nuance here is that right now, it's not, nobody can really define for, for me, and I've talked to like really smart people, like the people who have written the papers that like powers everything, all our encryption, everything. Well, not all the encryption, but like our systems, right? That, that, er, that the whole space is like the primitives, all this type of stuff is built on, right? Um, nobody can tell me what the right level of decentralization is to get a certain amount of security. Nobody. Is it three nodes? Is it seven? Is it 21? Is it 1,200? It's 111? I've, it's, I, I've heard all this, but there's, there's no clarity, right? And, and the clarity is like, we have 10,000 nodes and we have five mining pools and all the dApps use, you know, one infrastructure provider and good luck figuring it out. I'm just like, okay, thanks. But that's not, that's not, that doesn't seem like the, the answer, right? Like the, what the answer probably looks like is we have in, informed data-driven points of view on this many independent node operators that have this level of decentralization in certain key points of their infrastructure. You know, this is the additional security, something like trusted execution environments get you. Um, this is the additional security you get from a certain level of deposits and you know, how much value are you securing? Are you securing that much value? Okay, maybe you should think about this configuration. And here's a really informed point of view on why this configuration of node operators works for you based on your security assumptions. Instead of like, like the, the, the nuance is there's, there's no, well, I really think the nuance is we're, we're trying to create a framework where we're starting to see the emergence of a framework to create clarity about these questions. Because the way that we're building Chainlink, the way that we're building all these um, relationships between contracts and oracles, it requires the generation of this data. It, it, it requires people to generate commitments and it requires them to put up stake and it requires them to, to do all of these steps that when you look at them in aggregate should be, allow you to form a picture about whether you should use three nodes or five or seven or 21. Not that you should just, I don't know, wing it and probably use three or maybe a thousand. Like, I don't know, who knows? Good luck. By the way, don't forget to tell everybody to put a billion dollars into it. I don't, you know, this is, this is the real kind of like, um, I think this is, this is, this is the really interesting core question that I, I think if we can make um, these relationships very clear between oracles and smart contracts, I think that clarity will eventually turn, that data will eventually provide this clarity, right? If it's, if it's structured enough and clear enough. Now I'm gonna go slightly more into, into how that would look. Um, and, and, and by the way, I don't, I don't have any issue with like the decentralized infrastructure of today. I think, you know, for today, the decentralized infrastructure of today with thousands of nodes 
and block rewards and you know this type of system makes complete sense but i think the reality is that like i wanted to answer this question i want to be able to sit down with somebody in a year or two and tell them how may how much decentralization and what security properties their node operators should guarantee them for X amount of value? I want to have an answer to that question. I, I think we should. That's kind of my. I'm excited. I want. I want to know. Um, one one dimension of that answer is uh, implementing a web of trust model. So web of trust is kind of how PGP, uh, Open PGP, all those all those types of things. Um, it's not not exactly what they work, but they. They rely on some of the assumptions here. And the, the, the assumptions are that if you have certain public keys um, acting what's called as a trusted introducer or you know, signing off on, on their trust in another, in another key, that key then becomes um, more reliable for some category of activity, whether it's messages or, or whatever it might be. Now in our case, this actually happens naturally. So in, in the PGP world, when you want to create a web of trust model, sometimes you have to meet up with people. And you have to like, you know, validate each other's keys and like, or, or do all kinds, of, all, all kinds of things to like really verify that this is the person's key because the electronic methods of communication are not sufficiently reliable or gameable or who knows what could happen, right? In our model, if a decentralized finance um, DAP, and an insurance DAP, and a gaming DAP, another DeFi DAP, and two other DAPs that do something else. You can see that these contracts are using this Oracle. Right? You, can, you, you, you get a natural web of trust model where there's these five or 15 or 10 contracts. We know that this contract belongs to this DeFi project or that gaming project. And we know that it's done 20,000 transactions with, with this Oracle. So, so now, now we know that you know, this Oracle is used by all these contracts in a way that the Oracle operator didn't just make them to fake traffic, right? So this is, this is like scratching the surface of how a model like this could look, right? One, one part of the model is all of this data. And I guess that that's what I didn't really get into. In this slide, you see us retaining a lot of data about exactly what's happening, when it's happening, how many confirmations, how successfully this node operator performed their commitment, right? And, and here what you see is you see the kind of a model of how the aggregate data of that node operator performing the, the, that commit, those commitments to multiple nodes, uh, to multiple contracts, to multiple users could add up in this web of trust model, which is, a very, which is basically the functioning model for like the most secure form of messaging. Um, so yeah, basically, um, I think this is how this is gonna evolve. I, I, th I think what's gonna happen is we, we, we are in the process of vetting a large amount of candidates and, and we do apologize if, you know, there's, there, there, if we haven't gotten to, to vetting you yet. Um, we, we have a huge backlog of, of folks and we're, we're kind of, scaling up that team and, and our integrations team and we're just doing our best to kind of keep up. Um, but we think what's gonna happen is there's gonna be more high quality node operators. They're gonna be able to represent more and more information about why they're a good node operator. And that'll allow you to intelligently reason about how do I combine those node operators into an Oracle network that I actually want to trigger my contract with. And it won't be some like hand wavy like I don't know who the node operator is, and I don't know who, what the data sources they use are, and I don't know what infrastructure they run, and they have no deposit, but you should just, you know, have them trigger a billion dollars, and you should just use one. That's what you should do. I don't know. I, I, this, 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 this is the dynamic we want to get away from. We want to get towards the dynamic of, um, just like you show people Ethereum, and you say, we use Ethereum, it's reliable, you should be able to show people an Oracle network and say, here's my Oracle network of seven node operators. Here's why you should trust each of them. Here's why you should trust them in aggregate. Um, here's the commitments they've made. Uh, here's the infrastructure they use. Here's, here's, here's the other systems they use, right? This is why you should trust this system to trigger 
this, uh, you know, this highly reliable contract we're, we're involved with, you and me. That, that to me seems like the, um, that's the type of contract I want to participate in. Like if somebody were to sit, you know, convince me of like, enter into this contract with me, that is the level of detail that I would want if I could get it. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a number of dynamics and this is kind of just scratching the surface. Um, I just wanted to kind of put this together and, you know, put it, put it in front of you folks. I know a lot of you are really involved and smart and, you know, I'm thrilled to talk about it after, and, you know, you can send us emails and chat more. And, but this is kind of scratching the surface of what I think we're really trying to achieve. What, what we're really trying to achieve is um, decentralization that's informed and, and security that's um, the ability to purchase security in an informed way. I, I don't know if that's clear. I know I'm, I seem to be repeating myself, but I just, this is, it's, it's not the clearest kind of formulation yet maybe, but you know, the ability for people to purchase security in a way that they, they know that if they add two more nodes, they get that much more, this much more security, that clarity um, I think is very useful. Uh, so, you know, what could we do with that clarity? I guess, guess another example, um, let's say you're shipping huge amounts of um, frozen goods, huge amounts of some other good. Um, you would want to know where, where are the goods? Did the goods remain frozen? Because if they didn't remain frozen, they're useless and you need to get paid your money because you can't sell them because they, you know, were spoiled or something. You want to make sure the, you know, this, this place where they're stored is secure. Um, these are actually real conditions for real frozen goods shipments insurance contracts um, worth a lot of money, hundreds of them. Uh, then you want uh, to know that it's clear customs. You, you want to know that it's not delayed in getting delivered to whatever distribution center is sending it to whatever uh, grocery store. And then you actually want to know that it's, you know, you know, the truck driver didn't fall asleep or whatever, and it's on the way to your, um, to your warehouse. And, uh, you, 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 you want to, if, if, if what we're going to do, like, I think it's just important that we kind of look at what we're really telling people, right? What, what we're really telling people is um, you have all these fallback systems, right? You have these three-day delays, and you have all these, like, human checks. You have all these fraud-proofing, um, human-based analysis systems that you use today, and we're telling them they suck. We're just like showing in, up in meeting after meeting and we're going like, you have to wait three days to get a payment. That sucks. And then we're telling them like, you know, you have to wait, you have, your insurance adjuster has to look at a claim. That's so stupid. That sucks. Why don't you just connect it to, to this thing and then that can pay out 10 million automatically. And the thing is that we really gotta be right about that. We can't go to these people that run and own all these contracts and say to them, hey, don't worry about it, you'll fire, you know, don't use the, the, the human approach, just connect it to the data feed and then build it in some janky way where like something fall completely, you know, somebody defrauds them of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. I, you know, that's not, that's not what the space, this space is about for me, right? What this space is about for me is, um, like making something like this work in a way that it's both more efficient than the you know three day whatever system they have, but it's it's also it's more secure, so that somebody can't just game some dimension this and steal ten million dollars. Because just so you guys know, if that type of stuff happens, right? If we build systems this way, people lose like you know cryptocurrency exchanges get hacked. Everybody gets really worried. And they're like, oh, private key management. Oh my God, it's so tough. It's never going to happen. And everybody's like, the whole space is never going to happen. And that happens every time somebody loses five hundred million dollars, right? Like, think of what we're doing as like a new, a, a, a new subset of the space, right? Where we're saying we can get your contracts to work extremely efficiently because all the anti-fraud and all the fallback kind of bullshit you baked in, we we can do all that like this and it'll still work. And then if people actually do that and somebody loses $500 million because you know, some systems like you know, some, something like 
this wasn't, you know, somebody rolled something and put it in their basement in a server somewhere and just like, it's okay, don't worry about it. We're gonna have a problem. What we wanna do is we wanna set a very, I think what we wanna do is we set a very high standard for avoiding a problem like that. And I think once we set a sufficiently high standard, the, um, the CIOs, lead architects, all the people building DeFi, all these types of folks, they'll be able to launch like entire new markets, entire new products, just as quickly as they were able to like code up a Solidity contract or you know copy a Solidity contract, right? Um, kind of like jumping all over the place. So am I out of time? No, I'm not. I'm just worried. So I'm going off on my own thing. Insurance adjustment. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, okay. Then you want to pay people. Uh, I think that's relatively clear. You do all this stuff with the insurance contract, and then you want to pay, right? If you if you can't pay, uh, it's going to be tough for people to purchase this product, this contract. It's like if I told you, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy your house, but I can only I, I can only pay you in something that like you don't want to get paid in. You know, you just you're probably gonna do business with the guy who can buy the house in something that you want to get paid in. Like that's the unfortunate reality of adoption still, um, until you know, everything else gets built that solves that problem. But until then, and I think that will happen. But until then, I think there is definitely the need for a stopgap where you execute payments. Um, yeah, so that's that's essentially another another dimension of what we do. Another dimension of what we do is um, we try to expand what contracts do, and we try to make sure that it's done securely. But what we're also trying to do is we're making kind of pre-made chain links. So what that means is there's a chain link connected to a specific data source, like crypto price or weather data or IoT data or whatever categories of data you might want to consume. And we're making um, this chain link easily consumable. It's actually easier to consume for a smart contract from a developer's point of view than it is to consume an API. Like all the developer really has to do is they need to copy paste a code snippet into the contract. That contract then reaches out to the, to the Oracle contract, forms the relationship and then begins, begins receiving the data. So I, I think there's a dimension here of where we want this capability to exist, where you expand beyond just tokens and state changes. We need it to exist extremely securely, and um, we want to make consuming that very easy. We want to make it so that you show up and you say, you know, I want um, the federal funds rate, and I just type that in, and I get, a, you know, I get, I get, a, I get something I can connect to my contract today. It's live on chain today. It's consistently feeding data about that topic. And I, I don't even need to learn the API as a developer. All I need to do is, is connect my contract to the contract that's gonna provide me the data. Um, and making this large collection of, of um, chain links is, is, is also, I think, important for usability and adoption. Now, um, I think we've covered binding commitments. We've covered a few other things. I think the next thing is trusted execution environments. Um, I feel like if I pause for questions now, I'm never gonna get to this. So I'm just gonna do it really quickly. And if you're falling asleep, I apologize. Because I know I have a voice that kind of just like goes off. Um, but um, yeah. So the, the, the next dimension of this is uh, something called defense in depth where you layer on additional levels of security. And in our case, that additional, the, the initial additional level is something called trusted execution environments. That's the use of a segregated um, kind of piece of memory and processing um, and processor that can separately, completely separately from the OS, execute uh, basically trusted computations. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting model. It's very, it's still early. And what it, I don't, I don't think it's a cure all, but what I think it does is it hardens, um, it hardens uh, a node operator. And it hardens them in actually very interesting ways where even the node operator could not know what they're doing, but they're doing it. And that creates a certain dimension of privacy, as well as a number of really interesting other issues um, or benefits, depending on how you look at it. 
Uh, essentially, what trusted ex execution environments do is, you know, they make this segregated piece of hardware. And what that means is that a lot of the um, vulnerabilities and a lot of a lot of the stuff that basically gets into people's servers and and takes control of all kinds of processes and runtimes and all kinds of stuff um, is basically through the hypervisor level or through the operating system or through the BIOS or any number of these other things. And this is the sense in which it hardens it. Right? It's not a cure-all, but to get through a system like this is much tougher than injecting some malware, right? It's not, I mean, that's kind of, that's a lot of what security is, right? It's like a cat and mouse game. And this is right now um, assumed to be something that can genuinely harden mm, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, once again, um, I, I, the, the key point here is I won't spend too much time on it. There's um, basically privileged code. That privileged code creates a large surface, uh, surface area. That large surface area causes problems. With trusted execution environments, you don't really have that surface area. You have a segregated processor and memory uh, that can run your computations. That's that's basically the gist of it. Uh, it's like it's like HSMs, but really good, <laughs> and they, and they can do computation. Uh, the system we use for this is something called Town Crier. Um, Town Crier is um, a very thoughtful approach to how you validate data. So what our what we actually do with these initially is we validate that the TLS on the handshake and, and the certificate scheme is uh, working and correct. And then the, um, the trusted execution environment provides an attestation that it verified the certificate and the handshake and the signature scheme. And that, you know, that attestation <coughs> assumes that the useful uh, dimensions to this, one dimension that's very useful is you can actually send <laughs> in, you know, encrypted code over to a node operator and they could run it and they could not know what it is. Um, the other important thing is that a node operator can't get into the computation. And what that means is that their, their options now as a node operator, as an adversary, are very limited. Assuming keys are secure, um, what they can basically do is turn off their node. Which, okay, <laughs> you stop responding. We're really not gonna do this with you again, right? Let's, let's make sure that the data-driven system I described highlights that and that there's a programmatic way for people to make a decision about you in the future. And then you can do the math on how much money you lost by, um, by deciding to stop responding. Because you know you wanted to put up some stake, but you decided to also do some adversarial stuff. So the way that works should play out is it shouldn't work for you. And what this should do is it should make, it should make that um, more apparent or more difficult to get away from. Uh, yeah, the other thing is all those payment systems that were on the right side of the slide, um, a lot of the times they need payment credentials, like passwords that move money. So sometimes it's, it, it might be a good idea to put that in a more hardened environment, if you could, right? So the, 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 that's the other nuance here. I think, I think the nuance here is you want greater and greater degrees of security that as, you, uh, as you can provide them. And those greater degrees of security, they function on the level of how secure is the software, how secure is the, the thesis about decentralization, um, and how secure, well, and how predictive or how accurate or how reasoned are the methods of considering which nodes to use and which collection of nodes to use, right? So I think the combination of decentralization being a valid thesis, um, Oracle software being written well, and there being a way to intelligently select node operators and combine them into networks. I think th those three, if those three preconditions can be met, um, then we can arrive at a, a new level of security for, for, the, for an Oracle mechanism and therefore a new level of applications that are able to use that mechanism. Um, yeah, a very quick example. I said I'd keep this quick. This really isn't quick, I'm sorry. I'll speed it up. Um, essentially, the um, a, a good example, just to put into context, examples are always useful. Lottery contract, lottery contract is basically just two parts. It's the contract on chain which gives out winnings and it's randomness. Um, so you need randomness. So in the case of trusted execution environments, you could generate the randomness in this more reliable environment. It could return the randomness from this hardened environment to the lottery contract. And now 
if you were to average out the security of the contract in, it, in how it consists of both the randomness and the contract, you now reach a higher level of security. And then, if you were to think about it some more and you were to say, okay, well, you know, my lottery contract really has a lot of money in it now. It has millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in it. Maybe I really want to make sure that it's secure and that it's not gameable and somebody isn't just stealing the money somehow, right? Uh, the logical thing to do, this is where that centralization thesis is important, is you can do something like this. And you can intelligently select multiple node operators that, in our case, we would float information like, these node operators use SGX. These node operators have been providing randomness to these five top gaming contracts for three years. And all of their um, commitments, all of their service agreements have been fulfilled completely on time and with you know, the latency described in the service agreement. And then you would make a decision about, okay, these are the three node operators. And then as the value of the contract grew, you would go beyond three to five to seven to, you know, relative to the, probably relative to the value of the contract and relative to the amount of uh, guarantees that, that node operators provide, which includes things like stake and you know, a bunch of others. Being able to pay people the way they want is good. I think, okay, I'm just gonna skip over this, 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 uh, this part. I think it's relatively clear. Um, yeah, we make a lot of these inputs and outputs um, and we're shameless kind of, is that okay? It's fine. Okay, yeah, so we're hiring for we, um, we recently gained a substantial amount of adoption. Um, we're continuing to see a lot of demand. We're hiring for a lot of different roles. Um, there's even more on, on careers.chain.link. Uh, you know, we're looking to work with smart people interested in solving this problem in, in all kinds of roles. Product management roles, senior software engineer roles, um, integration engineers, that's a good way to get started and to look at how to get all these systems to work together, you get to learn a you know, bunch of different blockchains and APIs and get, to, get them to all work together. Uh, but yeah, if, if you're interested, uh, we're, we're open source. We function internally through like a constructive dialogue where the best ideas went out. That's what we strive for. And uh, we're completely fine working with people remotely. We're an open source project. And we, um, if you want to have an office, we can get you an office. If you want to work at home, it's fine. We're just very um, results oriented. So you can do it however you want, but you need to get results. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're interested in working with us, please please let us know. Uh, this would probably be the, if you are interested in this, this would probably be the right time to contact us because we're filling um, like certain important positions. Great, so thank you very much. Um, you. Questions? Uh, yeah, this guy's consistent. Hello. Hi. Um, so what kind of uh, contracts do, do uh, chain links have with their data sources? Yeah, that's a much more nuanced question. That, uh, that, isn't, uh, that isn't something that we can make as clear because it's not on chain, fundamentally speaking. We could provide that information and we, I think, will eventually end up at a place where we end up kind of ranking data providers as well, because there will be so much data about their reliability, and then there's ways to make their reliability cryptographically provable, partly through trusted execution environments, so that's where you start to blur the line, um, and you start to like, you know, if a data provider gets enough revenue from triggering contracts, they will implement certain cryptographic um, kind of protocols into their infrastructure once those are implemented, then they can. Then you can have reliable proof about whether they fulfilled their commitments. Before then, it's just going to be a bunch of promises and like contracts and a whole bunch of different stuff, which which may be better than nothing for some people. But realistically, the um, the best option I think is once again decentralization. And I think for some reason I'm missing a slide on that, but th th there is a level of decentralization you can achieve where you have multiple data providers. And right now we have Oracle networks like that working where we have multiple data providers feeding to multiple oracles, um, arriving at um, kind of an on-chain value that's decentralized at the oracle level and at the data provider level. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's really the best you can get, you can probably get to today. Does that answer? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Sergey, for the presentation. Um, yeah, where do you see the blockchain space will be by the end of next year? I'm super bullish on these things. Like, don't ask me. Like, I'm always like, we're gonna make it like next month. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, re realistically, I've been, I've been for years, for years. I've just been like, it's gonna happen, um, and it is happening slowly. Um, it, it, there's a lot of factors. I mean, there's just there's just a, a ton of a ton of different factors that some of them aren't even technical, and uh, I've stopped making these predictions. I'm I'm very excited. Let me put it that way. But but I I can't really make a prediction where like yeah I'm always thinking I'm I'm always like it's gonna you know this is the year or you know yeah basically it's always this is the year from my point of view. Re realistically, from what I'm seeing with like POCs and these types of things, I think, uh, I mean, I think that's also really tough to predict. What, what usually happens there is like a competitor gets into a market and starts making money, and then everybody runs in because they have this like fast follower thing where they think they're being clever because somebody else did the work for them. But it's it's very hard to predict. Uh, I I, I uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not that right about this. So I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I'm an insurance company, I probably have an incentive to be centralized in that uh, I prefer to have the option to audit and to maybe string out a payment process and uh, you know potentially lower my 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 risk in the transaction. So a key part of this seems that we need to really convince insurance companies to participate in the ecosystem. Do you think that that'll? How, how do you see that flowing? Um, in insurance, there's a few dynamics. Uh, one dynamic is a lot of insurance markets are geographically focused monopolies that are state issue. And so the um, competition is relatively low. Um, the example I gave where one of them does it, like Progressive or somebody, somebody goes in and starts using telematics data from cars and they start pricing policies better. And then everybody's like, you know, everybody, everything's on fire. And in like a year, they all start doing it because Progressive is literally taking all their customers away, giving them better policy prices, and they're like they have they're doing it so well that they can put an ad budget behind it and just win, right? Um, I, I think I think that's really how it's going to evolve in insurance because the dynamics there are slightly stunted from a like um like monopolistic kind of so there's certain tendencies like that. Um, I think in your example of I want to be able to adjust things, I think yeah for like catastrophic risk insurance. Um, it pays out $100 million to an island. Yeah, that's going to, yeah, okay. I don't, that might take some time to, to get them on board, right? But the reality is that a lot of insurance folks, they don't want to deal with this stuff. They don't, like, it depends on the, on, on, on the value of the policy. It depends on um, the fraud levels. A, a, a lot of the time, yeah, they, they're looking for better and better systems. I, I, think, I think that the really interesting thing in insurance is, I mean, they're going to all securitize all their um, policy cash flows. <laughs> it's, it's like, right, the, 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 the whole securities infrastructure is probably going to be blockchain based in the next decade, I think. Once again, I'm really bullish. <laughs> I'm really like, you know, excited. Um, I think I think that's that's really interesting. I think that um, I think one of them is going to go in. They're going to make a ton of money by making better policies, and then if they're really smart, they're going to securitize those. They're going to make even more money, and then people in like the reinsurance industry will just yeah. It, it, it's a long conversation, but that's what I does that add up for you? It does. Okay, great. I don't need to repeat the question, right? Because the thing is doing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. yeah. I'm really bad at that. Sorry. Hi, my name is Tracy. I have a question. In Hi, regards to, I'm trying to figure out, like, as far as Chainlink, and I know you said that Oracle's of like that software in between. How does um, Chainlink compare to IBM's like um, Hyperledger? Um, we, we actually we work with Hyperledger, so what Definitely. we we service a bunch of different blockchains. Mm -hmm. And we, Hyperledger also needs oracles. That's my next question. 
That's then that's the answer. Hyperledger needs oracles. Quorum needs oracles. Okay. Um, every system that's actually going to secure your contracts in a way that you get the extreme reliability that you want from decentralized infrastructure is going to need oracles. That's that's our assumption right now. That's what seems to be true right now. So you're not just enterprise space. This is for whomever needs it, or are you are you in the enterprise lane? We're we're blockchain agnostic. So we, we support a, um, a number of DeFi projects, public chain projects. We support, uh, we, we support a number of folks, including an, 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 an enterprise contracts. Mm -hmm. what, what our interest really is, is in making this next generation of contracts happen. We, we, I, I want to see a new movie. Like I've been watching the same, I've been seeing tokens, the token movie for a long time. It's a nice movie. I like it. Don't get me wrong. It's been about six years. I want to see something new. Well, I have a question. So how has the industry been as far as acceptable to your solution? What's been the feedback? Are people still pushing back against the idea due to decentralization and they don't really get the idea of the necessity of it? When you, when you say enterprise, it varies between industries. Like certain enterprise, when you say enterprise, you mean like larger I, I really mean large institutions right. because my fear with decentralization is they'll be the one to come and buy up the startups and eat up all the technology and it's not accessible to small but so I don't yeah <laughs> okay if, if that's your I don't, no I don't that's not the question I just want to know is this idea of being well receptive as a necessity because I, I mean I view it as a necessity but how have people been receptive to it the answer to your question is yes the, the people that understand the technical requirements and understand the usefulness of this system relative to how they do digital agreement today, they are extremely receptive and they've been receptive for years, they have. The nuance is that they are not ahead of business. They do not make certain decisions about um, you know, top line revenue objectives. And so this is, this is the nuance. Um, and I think that nuance is gonna become extreme, is gonna become simplified very quickly when literally one of them goes out in, in a specific subset of you know, enterprise or specific industry and they just start making a ton of money because they have a better digital agreement. Um, I think that's what's gonna happen. I'm, I, I'm seeing that happening slowly, but I think when it starts happening, then it's gonna happen quickly. I, I don't think it's like a gradual thing like, oh, they let us know and then and by next year, no, it's, it's, gonna be, it's, it's, like, it's gonna be like the internet. It's gonna be like the internet. I, I think that's what, because th that's what's gonna happen, right? Somebody's gonna be like, you know, here's my quarterly earnings report. And it's like, I just, I just, I'm an insurance company. I just sold triple my revenue in um, securitized uh, insurance cash flows. And all the insur other insurance companies are gonna get on their earnings call and they're gonna say what? They're gonna say, we're not pursuing that. No, they're gonna make up that they're pursuing it and they're going to call everybody and say, get it done by Thursday or else we're all fired because they just made triple the money and like we got hired for this. So just, I don't care, you know, and then it's going to happen. Um, uh, sorry, you, you talked about, uh, you talked about the binding commitments. Uh, uh -huh. Is there something in the node code that says, hey, you know, let's say multiple smart contract operators or writers. Um, is there something to prevent overcommitment of collateral of deposits? Overcommitment of collateral? No, that 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 hasn't been um, kind of fine tuned yet. I think what's going to happen is that people are going to develop their own systems and their own algorithms around how. I, th I think it's going to be a market. It's, it's going to be a market for how many how many fees are you paying me? How much collateral? How much stake do I have to put up? Uh, who are you? and who are the other oracles in my network, right? And so this is why a lot of the data about who are the other oracles in my network, who are you, how, many fee, how much fees are you gonna pay me? And you know, let me do the math on that. That, um, we're still pretty early in the evolution of this, so that's still evolving, just to be clear. And it seems like you have another question. I was just I was saying that you understand where I'm coming from in terms of you know, potentially having a massive amount of smart contracts with their value running through, you know, not that they're running through the, you know, set of nodes, but different contract operators or writers don't know that other ones are using the same set of nodes per se, and you only have a limited amount of staking or collateral that a potential node has, right? 
So yeah, we're, we're 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 examining this question, and I think regardless of how deeply we examine it, and we, we are examining it, and we are doing research on it, and we are kind of building econometric models around this stuff. I think at the end of the day, it's it's going to be a market, and it, it's just going to evolve on its own as a market. And the most that we can do is provide some ideas or some guidance or some framework for considering um, the risks and the fees and you know for both sides of the market. And that's really our role. Our role is to build this software. Our role is to enable this economic activity and to enable all of these people to build these systems. Is that great? I, I think uh, this this guy here has been just, if you don't mind. You know, I, I know them, and they're they're good, smart guys, and I haven't looked at enough recently at, at what they built. But I think um, I think the goal there is more s some kind of premium data feeds product, um, more for enterprise implementations, private chain implementations. And I, from what I remember, I and I, I think we're more focused on these kind of um, decentralized, multiple oracle. Um, how do you define what a good oracle is? I think realistically, similarly to how you know, provable slash oracleize and, and some other folks, I think realistically there, there, there might, there's, there's a dynamic where certain people like Rhombus and others that just want to sell uh, oracle services, uh, I think it, it makes sense that they could be part of an oracle network. I mean, our goal, just so you understand, we actually ourselves, Chainlink, don't want to run an oracle. Right. We just like Ethereum doesn't work because the Ethereum Foundation runs Ethereum nodes. We, we are just in the early stages of the network. Our goal is not to run an Oracle. Our goal is to make a framework for people to intelligently select Oracles into Oracle networks that effectively gives them um, a, an Oracle mechanism that allows them to build this next generation of contracts. That, that plan does. So there, there's no competitive dynamic. Um, we would, in fact, in later stages, enable good node operate oracles like Rhombus, like others, to get traffic. That that is our goal. If we can enable that, um, and it, and it works for that for them and others as well, because you know if the decentralized thesis proves out for oracles, then you would want to be part of the quorum that gets selected, right? Does that? Okay. Good. I, I think I think the nuance here is I, I don't I don't I, I think they want to run a high quality Oracle service, which I completely understand. And I you know I think they're smart, really nice guys. And I think our goal is to build a system where we have enough traffic and enough clarity where good node operators like them get extremely well rewarded for for being part of somebody that triggers a contract. Oh for being sorry, for being part of a network that triggers a contract, assuming that people want networks, right? This is assuming that people want Oracle networks, that the idea of decentralization at the level of the Oracle makes sense. Oh man, I didn't repeat the question. Is, is it clear with the question? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I'm so hung up on this, but does that answer? You asked my question. Great, you're welcome. Sir, you thanks for the talk. Uh, my question was, uh, if you look at your example of the frozen foods um, slide that you had, where it seems to me that now that sort of shifts the easiest attack vector at the actual um, uh, data provider level, where say you have you can actually mess with the sensors on the actual truck or what have you. And I'm curious what you think about that. And obviously, there's a few use cases where you can decentralize even the providing data, like in the coin market example, where you have multiple providers of, say, the price of Bitcoin, but how that would work in more, I guess, private or enterprise uh, cases, like in the frozen foods example. 
Yeah, um, I think the way that this will evolve is you'll probably just have more sensors for higher value things. But in the IoT example, if you have one sensor that just gets selected and that's the only one, that's a risk. And then, and then the question becomes, okay, well these sensors, like one good example is solar panel fields, right? Solar panel fields, you don't insure like every single solar panel, you insure like a percentage of functional solar panels for a field. And in that case, you have multiple sensors. Like the percentage, like each solar panel does have a sensor. And so you can know what its output is, right? Um, I think that's the answer. I think, I, my, my assumption, and once again, this is just a key kind of assumption, is that the decentralization security model and thesis for securing contractual outcomes makes sense. And that means that if all of a sudden millions or billions of dollars starts getting released in solar panel insurance, and this is the preferred method to do that, and that depends on these sensors, then at a certain point you're gonna to get to a lower level of integration with those sensors. And that's, that's also where an Oracle becomes extremely useful in that it can do things like validate the signatures from a sensor. We're just not at that point yet because the value secured by those sensors isn't sufficiently high. But I think if this evolves, as I'm assuming it would, that you would, you would probably arrive at that, that level. Does that answer your? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to do this successfully. The question was, um, wh where, where is the risk so high that the sensors are getting redundantly embedded? Um, the only thing I've heard from like really smart crypto folks is things like um, you know, space shuttles have a lot of redundant sensors. I've heard things like that. That's an example, um, but other other than that, uh, yeah, I can't really say right now. Hi, Sergey. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here today for this talk. It was very nice. Um, thank you for coming. Of course. Uh, my question is about uh, most of the examples that I've seen uh, in the outputs. It tends to be some form of payment where, uh, say, you're sending some BTC to an address or you're depositing USD into a bank account. Uh, my question is, what if I want to transmit data instead of sending money? So suppose I have some contract, I have an external API that's not on chain, uh, but I want to receive some of the aggregated results from the contract in my you know, server that's off chain. Uh, is that type of thing supported using Chainlink? Sorry, I blanked at a key point when you were asking. Could you just ask again? I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> I don't want to be a jackass and give you some weird answer. Sorry. Uh, so, so suppose I've run a contract using Chainlink, right. um, but instead of uh, the output being some form of payment in terms of money, what if I wanted the output to be a data payload that I send to some server off chain? Is that supported? Yeah, so you mean like source code escrow or something? Yeah, okay. So some, some kind of data that you send off chain, well, it depends whether you want the node operator to know the data. If you don't, you would have a preference for SGX, for T's. You would encrypt the data and put it into the Oracle. And then the Oracle would essentially become kind of like a data escrow service, which is useful for source code escrow and you know, some other examples like that. And then you would, um, you would release the data from that, from that node. Uh, this is assuming, does that answer? I think so. Um, and so the data could be encrypted uh, such that the Oracle has no knowledge of its contents. If you use TEs, well, or, or you could just send encrypted data and the Oracle can send forward on encrypted data. That can happen without TEs. But yeah, like um, I'm assuming, like th there, there's dynamics where, you know, maybe you have some kind of algorithm for testing ad data and you put that, that algorithm into a TE environment and then the Oracle tests ad data before it pays for it or something like that. It depends if you if you need the node operator to run the code. If you don't, then it's pretty simple. I think. Well, it's relatively simple. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome.
Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so I had a question. Uh, so for say like uh, price feeds for Bitcoin into like mm -hmm. Oracle network, uh, if there's a, and you're using multiple different data sources, mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with the situation where there's some discrepancies between the prices, either mm -hmm. like small discrepancies or like very large discrepancies? Like how do you kind of resolve that? Yeah, so there, there's a few levels to this. The, the most immediate level is you form a way to do a median or a mean calculation. And then what you do is you basically use aggregators. So the situation you might not want to be in is you might not want to build a whole thing where you are responsible for aggregating data and coming up with like the average from each exchange. There are a number of large, now relatively large number of high quality data providers that act as aggregators and they smooth out things like, you know, that um, some exchange gets locked up and the price goes high and they like, they like exclude that. So the burden is kind of shifted to these data aggregators. And then the difference between them is relatively small. And then you have uh, a method of arriving at um, basically a median calculation so that none of the individual Oracle network participants can wait the thing too, like, too badly. So is, is there some sort of like punishment mechanism if like an Oracle is like too far off or like how, like how do you kind of, like cause like one Oracle can sort of still aim it a little bit, right? Like, so how do you, well, how it depends you if you're doing a median that? or a mean or how you're calculating it. But the answer to your question about the, the penalty, the economic penalty, that's currently in the process of, of being worked on. So the, the answer, the answer to how this is solved now is you have multiple aggregators, they smooth out whatever weirdness, so that, that burden is not on the node operator. And then the aggregators are relatively similar. And then, then you have some kind of mean or median calculation that's meant to avoid. Um, and the more oracles you have, the better in that scenario. We, we actually have oracle networks that successfully do this now um, for like the ETUSD price. Uh, if, you need, if, you need, if you need that network, uh, I'm glad to talk about it. Hi, Sergey. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Yeah, really amazing. Thanks, thanks for coming. Oh, I had a question in regards to uh, Libra. Is there any kind of relationship as to how Chainlink will interact with Libra as compared to Ethereum or any other protocol? I can't exactly like make any statements about what we like Libra, what we're doing with them exactly or not doing with them. I can we can think about how that could work. Yeah, how would how that could work is that just like we trigger um, payments in Bitcoin, we could trigger payments in Libra once it's more fleshed out. So in that sense, that's a pretty obvious uh, scenario for how you could use a chain link. Um, you, yeah, so if Libra, Libra seems to be a payment system and it seems to be focused on just payments. And so it's private key based. And so then you would need an Oracle to house certain private keys and you know, make certain payments. Remaining agnostic. Well, yeah, we can support that. Like the, yeah, the whole, the whole um, underlying idea of our, of our system is that there's this decentralization, there's multiple layers of security, and we support all of these chains. So that if you're a node operator and you want to make money mining inputs, you, you know, why not mine inputs on all the chains where there's transactions that where you could mine inputs into, right? That includes, you know, Libra and, you know, that, that type of stuff. Hi, um, Hi. this is a great talk, thanks. Um, just My a pleasure. follow up question, um, um, an earlier question, I guess, about um, the fact that um, the decision has been really made at the level that um, not, you know, the kind of expert who would like to push the, uh, the execution of this product. Um, Sorry, I apologize. I don't fully understand. Could you just repeat it one more time, please? Yeah, so um, obviously the security experts love the product, but um, a lot of the decisions have been made at the executive level who don't really see the value of it. Um, what's your solution to solve that problem? Do you feel this is a, a marketing problem? Do you feel this is a product problem? Is a business I, development problem? Sorry, I don't. I don't feel we have. We, we I don't feel we have a problem. I I, I, I feel that the the kind of business decision makers 
At a certain point, they defer to like lead architects and CIOs and some, somebody like that. And then if somebody fits it into the, like the, the, the business decision makers, a lot of, it depends who you mean, right? Like if it's somebody at a bank making some kind of derivatives contract, then if they're ahead of business, they just, they ship this off onto the lead architect or the PM or somebody. And then that's the person we usually deal with. If you're talking about data providers and larger data providers selling data, their concerns are usually around what is the volume of consumption of the data? How many, how many um, consuming contracts? I don't, I don't like our, our product is really much more technical and thankfully for us, there's enough adoption and there's enough um, interest at like the PM and the lead architect and the CIO and the senior developer level that it's, it's not our job. Like it's not our job to make sure that some organization decides to build a certain type of contract. It's our job that there's enough organizations doing that already that the ones that do it use us, right? So before that wasn't the case. Before we would walk around and we would like, there weren't enough people building smart contracts, but now there are. And so all we really have to do is service their um, product managers and the architects and senior developers. Does that? Great, thanks. Okay, I think that we'll do uh, two more questions. So, uh, okay. Hey, thanks a lot for coming. Um, yeah, so, are change right. nodes aware of each other? Is there any peer-to-peer -peer aspect at all? I feel like there's not, but I, I simple one. I mean, they're aware of each other as far as they, they might be in the same Oracle network, where they're providing data to the same contract. If you're talking about off-chain computation and peer-to-peer -peer messaging, that's something that's getting finalized. Um, great talk, Sergey. Yeah, so besides privacy, what are some of the major roadblocks and concerns that we have to overcome before we'll see a lot more large data providers running their own chain of nodes and participating on the network? I think the nuance here, and we, we've been talking with these people for years, and they're very smart, competent, logical people. I, I think the nuance is it's a chicken and egg problem. I think the nuance is that they need volume. Like you can talk to the head innovation guy or the CEO or whoever you want to talk to, but you eventually get to the head of business of a specific line of data, and there just isn't enough volume in our space yet. Uh, I think what needs to happen is the various other data providers that aren't like the top 10 or whatever, they will sell their data and they will lock in customers and they will do well. Those customers will grow um, and they'll grow to a point where large data providers want to be involved in the um, sale of data. Is that good? Okay. Uh, you mentioned all the different industries that mm -hmm. you know, use the trucking example, the shipping example, the insurance example. Then what industry out of all do you think it's going to penetrate first? Uh, or what do you expect it to penetrate first in, in for early adoption? Or, uh, yeah, I, th I think decentralized, I, this is the last one. I, I think um, I think decentralized finance uh, as a category, it's a very broad category, but that category has um, a lot of early adopters in the crypto community. Those contracts are readily buildable to a certain degree in today's infrastructure, together with with oracles. And yeah, I think I think decentralized finance type systems are the ones that. I mean, those contracts, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's it. I, don't, it's, it's, I think it's decentralized finance and then insurance. That's, that's my guess. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sergey. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is an excellent event. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I think there's still, there might still be food. If not, there are definitely drinks still in the back, so feel free to hang out and mingle. And, um, Okay, and, and if you guys want to hang out with uh, the Chainlink team, uh, go, or, uh, go, to, go to Forgery afterwards. Okay, great. Yeah, do we have an open bar there? Yeah. Okay, there's, there's an open bar at Forgery. So. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.
I think when those projects are ready, when they're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, let's see. We, we, still, we still have 350 people on there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should end stream. Good night, sweet ladies. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Have a nice event. Um, we are thinking to 